Hello and welcome to the SRNA Ask the Expert podcast series. This podcast is a community spotlight episode featuring SRNA community member Melanie Flood. My name is Chrissy Dilger and I will be moderating this podcast. SRNA is a nonprofit focused on support, education, and research of rare neuroimmune disorders. You can learn more about us on our website at wearesrna.org. Our 2023 Ask the Expert podcast series is sponsored in part by Horizon Therapeutics, Lexion AstraZeneca Rare Disease, and Genentech. Horizon is focused on the discovery, development, and commercialization of medicines that address critical needs for people impacted by rare, autoimmune, and severe inflammatory diseases. They apply scientific expertise and courage to bring clinically meaningful therapies to patients. Horizon believes science and compassion must work together to transform lives. Alexion AstraZeneca Rare Disease is a global biopharmaceutical company focused on serving patients with severe and rare disorders through the innovation, development, and commercialization of life-transforming therapeutic products. Their goal is to deliver medical breakthroughs where none currently exist and they are committed to ensuring that patient perspective and community engagement is always at the forefront of their work. Founded more than 40 years ago, Genentech is a leading biotechnology company that discovers, develops, manufactures, and commercializes medicines to treat patients with serious and life-threatening medical conditions. The company, a member of the Roche Group, has headquarters in South San Francisco, California. For additional information about the company, please visit www.gene.com. For today's podcast, we were pleased to be joined by Melanie Flood. Melanie has spent a career advocating for underserved communities in the U.S. and abroad. In 2020, an attack of optic neuritis caused her to lose her vision in her left eye. Being diagnosed with seronegative NMOSD with Sojourn syndrome, and the adversity she has faced since her diagnosis ignited a commitment in her to help other patients with rare diseases. Melanie founded Melly J Showroom, a European fashion agency based in California and London, which she ran concurrently for 13 years while working in advocacy as the director of communications for two trade organizations in the United Kingdom, Social Enterprise UK, a strategic partner of the cabinet office, and the UK Fashion and Textile Association, a trade challenge partner of the Department of International Trade. Melanie was also the Director of Development and Communications for Sacramento Food Bank and Family Services. During her time at SFBFS, she developed strategic communications, fundraising, and public awareness campaigns to address food insecurity in Sacramento County. She is currently the Director of Communications for the First Five Association of California, as well as its Complementary Foundation and the First Five Center for Children's Policy. Melanie is a graduate of the American Academy of Dramatic Arts in Los Angeles and the American Conservatory's MFA program. She is a fellow of the RSA, Royal Society of Arts, and recently became a Regional Policy Task Force Volunteer Co-Chair for the National Organization of Rare Disorders, NORD. She is currently writing a book about her health journey and is forming a foundation with the intent to shape health policy in California to support the rare disease community. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. Do you mind just briefly introducing yourself? Yeah, my name is Melanie Flood. I am a 47 year old woman who lives in Northern California. And I have NMOSD with a Sjogren syndrome. And in regard to your onset of the NMOSD, what age did you start experiencing symptoms? And what were these initial symptoms that you had? So my journey with NMOSD was, I think everyone's is unique. It was interesting. I started experiencing symptoms as a young child. I can remember from the age of seven, having heat sensitivity, vomiting from being in the heat on a trip to Arizona with my family when I was nine. 
I also had anxiety from the age of 11. I had depression from, I'd say, my teen years. And then the first major episode, I guess what people would call a, a relapse, was an episode of vomiting and hiccups I had when I was 23 years old. I had I was in grad school at the time. I used to be an actress, a stage actress. I went to the American Conservatory Theater's Master of Fine Arts program, and I was playing Belle on the main stage my second year during A Christmas Carol, and I had done about 26 shows in, or yeah, sorry, 40 shows in 26 days. It was a lot. And, you know, they were training us for stage and for Broadway, and you, you I, I basically had one day off a week, and I was going through the master's program at my time, but also doing a major role on the main stage with professional actors too. And so we just finished the show. I'd flown to New York for Christmas with a boyfriend at the time. His family was from there. And I went to my friends who I grew up with who were living in New York. And I had an episode of vomiting and hiccups that wouldn't stop. And so I went to a hospital there. I can't even remember which one. And and they couldn't stop the vomiting and hiccups. And I was discharged. I remember there was an ice storm. I was given some sort of a pill to make the vomiting stop. And ironically, we were in an elevator and there was a gentleman who managed the building and he was European and he didn't speak English. And I started throwing up in the in the elevator in and water mainly, just water. And he held my head in this way very tightly that it actually stopped the vomiting. And then so fast forward to 10 plus years later, as 2013, I'm living in London. I was working at the time. I I work in advocacy and I'm a communications director. And again, I have always, you know, been a career girl. So I've always been working a lot. And I owned a fashion business at the time as well. And so, you know, I was always thinking I was draining my body. That was what the fatigue was from. And I was having a lot of fatigue, but I had an episode of vomiting and hiccups. And a friend had come over that morning to help me. And she looked at me and said, do you need an ambulance? And I had actually lost my bladder. And that had never happened before. And so she called an ambulance. There were some comments made in the ambulance from the EMTs. I remember saying something about had I been out drinking the night before. And I had the vomiting and hiccups. And so I was hospitalized for about five days. And then that happened again and then discharged. And some terms were thrown around that maybe it was Crohn's disease or colitis or um, or leukemia. They said I had a very high white blood cell count that, that, but they couldn't find the infection. And six months later, I was hospitalized again, and it was a bit more severe with vomiting and hiccups. And at the time, I think it's important to mention, I was engaged to someone from Europe. He was Swiss and we had canceled our wedding. And so I tended to either when I was exhausted, have an episode, a relapse, or if something upsetting in my life had happened, I would have an episode like that and be hospitalized. But no one, yeah, so so that was way back in like 2013 and 2014 that those episodes happened. Wow, well, that seems like such a, a long journey to get to, to the point where you were actually where you were actually, you know, taken, taken seriously and, and given a real diagnosis. So I guess take us from there was, was that episode, that last one where you were finally given your diagnosis or? No, (laughs) I wish. So So I, I, I had crazy fatigue and in my thirties, the, 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 I'd never lost my bladder, but I was having urology issues. So I'd lived in Ireland for a while before London. I had a urologist. I, after those episodes, they had sent me to a GI doctor 
because I was having bowel issues. You know, they said I had IBS and all these things that now I know are related to NMO. But back then, um, I moved around a lot, but no one was putting the puzzle pieces together. I was certainly giving the information. What what my doctors do tell me now, especially my neurology team, they always say, you're so good at recounting dates and times and symptoms. And a lot of people don't remember, but like I said, I work in communications for a living. So I do document things that are happening to me and my symptoms. So, so I was about 38 at that time. Fast forward to 2020, and we were living in COVID times, and this was August. In the six months leading up to that August, so I would say from February 2020, I was having bowel and bladder symptoms, but the fatigue was just overwhelming. And I had I had an aunt who passed from cancer when I was about 30, and I used to say to my sister, oh, I'm like Aunt Sherry, I, I'm going to, I have cancer. I, I just would tell her I'm cancer tired. I'm so tired. I, I don't understand what's going on with my body. And because I had had an aunt that had passed from colon cancer, I thought for sure I, I had cancer. And so I, I was, I would have internal vibrations when I would sleep, but I didn't know what they were. So when my body would get really tired and, and this continues, I continue to have this to this day. It, I mainly feel it when I'm waking up in the morning, my body shakes inside, but you can't see it, but I can feel it. And it only happens when I'm awake, if I'm in an extreme heat or if I'm really tired. Um, and so I was having those issues. I was having narcolepsy. I didn't realize it was narcolepsy. I literally was driving to work and I couldn't stay awake. And it was concerning to me. And so I went to my doctor, my primary, she's fantastic. She started doing a lot of blood work. She found out I had a vitamin D deficiency. She put me on a vitamin D dose, which now, it, which I found out later was, is called an MS dose. And then she continued to do blood work. And what happened was come August, I woke up one morning and at this time I was, I think, yeah, 2020, I would have been 45. Yeah. I was 45 years old and I woke up and a few days before on the Friday in my left eye, I started noticing these little black clouds and I thought I had put on too much mascara or something, or I hadn't taken my makeup off properly. And I kept rubbing my eye and it wasn't, it, it, I wasn't wearing mascara. So I was confused. And then the next day I went out with my friend, my best friend, and she, I told her I was having trouble seeing. I thought because of COVID, you know, we all had a lot of Clorox wipes that I had cleaned and I had wiped my eye or something. And she put some eye drops in my eye. And this was the night before I lost my vision. And I woke up on the Sunday morning and my vision had come down like a black curtain about a half or sorry, a third down my left eye. And immediately I knew something was wrong and I went to urgent care. And actually I live behind a hospital. I live in the, in the greater Sacramento region and I drove to the hospital and they gave me this red card and they said, you need to go to the emergency room. And I, you know, I, I didn't realize what it was. And um, they said, can you get there yourself? It was like next door. I was like, yeah, I can drive. I, you know, I've lost some of the top of my vision. I went to the ER immediately. They, they triaged me and they told me they were putting me in an ambulance to UC Davis and that they thought I had a detached retina um, and that it was a Sunday and they didn't have the equipment to operate on me. And they were actually calling UCSF and UC Davis to see if they were available, if they had the equipment there. That's what they said. And so they put me in the ambulance. They said it was a surgery, but that I would like have to have it immediately within 24 hours. And so I get to UC Davis and the ophthalmology team comes in and they assess my retina. And then I see a neurology team comes in. And they start doing motor function tests on me. And 
my aunt was actually married to a neurologist when I was young. And I was like, in my head, why are they doing motor function tests on me if I have a detached retina? I was very suspicious. And I started asking questions and I heard the optometrist or the ophthalmologist say to her colleague who was a resident, wow, her retina looks beautiful. And then I knew, and they said, well, it could be optic neuritis. And that was the first time I heard those words. And I asked her if I needed surgery and she said, no, we treat it with steroids. And then that kind of started a whirlwind and that's when it all began. Yeah. Okay. Took, took a while to get there for yeah. sure, but, but obviously at least they, they got to it at some point. So can you just walk me through what the process process was like once that determination had been made that it was actually optic neuritis, you know, something neurology related instead of something else. Did your physicians do the blood tests for aquaporin 4 or the MOG antibody? What other kind of diagnostic tests were given? Yeah. So then the neurology team took over from there and they did a a battery of tests. I mean, I had a lumbar puncture. They didn't mention any of the diseases they thought I may have. And I learned out, I learned why later from my neurologist that they don't like to diagnose in the hospital. And so I didn't know that at the time. They basically told me, so I had chest x-ray, I had CT scan, I had MRIs, and my MRI was over four hours. I mean, it was the head, well, now I get them frequently, but back then, you know, it was the head, the the brain, the orbits, the thoracic and the th- cervical spine. And then all the blood tests, all the blood workup. And they basically said to me, we need to rule out everything. We need to make sure that we've ruled out everything. And this isn't caused by a virus or a bacteria or something before we start your treatment. And so they did, it was 24 hours. And in that 24 hours, by the end of the day, I think it was the end of the first day when I got the first solumedrol infusions, they were treating me with the corticosteroids. And by then I had, it had completely come down. It was a black curtain all day and it had gone to a pin and then it was gone. And I could still see in my right eye clearly And so they started the infusions. They did three days of corticosteroids on me. And then they sent me home. And I was told they had a neuro-ophthalmologist. And and I would be scheduled with her. And they would call me and a neurologist and a rheumatologist. Like a team would be put together for me. And again, it was just optic neuritis at that time. I wasn't sure what it was. And then I went in for my first appointment to see my neuro-ophthalmologist. I believe it was seven days later. And she did tests on me and she did visual field tests. And she looked at my optic nerve and, you know, they do all the OCT tests and all those kind of things. And she sat me down and said that it was jumping to my right eye and that I needed to go to the emergency room from her office and that they were going to put a catheter in my neck and they were going to do what's called plasma phoresis. Sorry, I get a little, (laughs) I I broke down crying a little bit (laughs) and she said, that's every, a lot of people have this reaction. I know it sounds scary. And I'm like, no, let's do what we have to do. And so, and she is a rock star. She saved my vision. Her name's Dr. Allison Liu. She's an amazing person. And I went 
they admitted me right in. I got two more doses of corticosteroids because I had had three. And then we started the plasmapheresis treatment. And generally they'll give you five treatments every other day for 10 days, but I was doing so well. They gave me seven. And, and, but at the time I had no, uh, no light in my left eye, completely black no vision. And the doctors would come in and out. I had rheumatology teams. I felt like I was an episode of Grey's Anatomy. And I would joke with all the doctors, the neurologists, you know, the rheumatology team would come in. I would say, oh, I'm not, a, I'm not a, I'm a series regular on Grey's Anatomy. I'm not a guest star, am I? <laughs> and they were like, you're so funny. But I feel like if you can't, laugh, like you're going to cry. Right. And it's okay to cry, but I choose to live in the world where I make fun of what I'm going through because it's so insane and you just can't make this stuff up. Right. And so I was released from the hospital and I had no light in the eye, zero. Uh, and I was worried that the treatments wouldn't work. And again, I hadn't heard, I had heard the words NMO from the team that was doing plasmapheresis actually the day I was leaving and I, I had a, a knee jerk reaction when one of the doctors said that to me because I had had other people come in. I had a neurologist come in and he told me I'd tested positive for Sjogren's. He told me I came up on a panel for lupus possibly, but they're actually, they, they're, that's not in my chart. They're not treating me for that, but I definitely had Sjogren's and that, that they had sent my, my lumbar puncture to the Mayo Clinic and that I tested negative for MOG, negative for NMO. And he told me, you don't want NMO. You do not want that. And we were hoping for MS. And I had, I will say this, I had two oligonchal bands too. And so I got out of the hospital and then I met with my neurologist. And that's when I was told that they believed I had seronegative NMO, which is an outlier, which is someone who doesn't test positive for the AQP4 antibody. And then he started talking to me about treatment plans. And oh, I should say this too. I was on 80 milligrams of prednisone from the beginning. And that's a whole other beast that we can talk about later. <laughs> but when I came out of the hospital and all the things that did to my body, but my rheumatologist said, no one goes blind on 80 milligrams of prednisone. And I will tell you that's correct, but it will mess up your teeth and your joints. And I had steroid my myopathy, which is paralysis and Everybody who, who knows about NMO knows that it attacks the optic nerve and the spine. And so when I came home from the hospital in the middle of the night, my best friend, she was staying at my place when I, when I was in the hospital and her and my sister and my mom, you know, they were my rock. And she was sleeping in my guest bedroom and I had to call her um, at 3.30 in the morning from my bed because I couldn't walk. And I thought I was having a relapse. And I mean, you can imagine what it's like to wake up blind, which I did, but then to wake up and not be able to walk when you get home from the hospital. But my primary physician, I called her right away in the morning. And because I could walk again after the pain was so severe. And she told me I likely had steroid myopathy, and which I did. But that happened twice, actually. And I had to call my sister at 3.30 in the morning one time and um, literally pull my body, not crawl because I couldn't walk, pull my body to my front door and open it so that she could come in to my house. So, you know, there were a lot of side effects happening alongside with the medication. It's like, I always say it's the lesser of two evils. It's like, I want to see and I want to walk. But within that, other things occur. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I just want to say I'm thank you for 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 telling us all this and I know that it it must have been such an emotional 
time and also makes, you know, I would make anyone emotional looking back and thinking about that time. So just appreciate you talking with us about it today because I do think it'll help others who are going through or have gone through the same journey know that they're not alone. So thank you. But truly, truly terrifying experience, I'm sure. I can't imagine waking up and not being able to see, you know? Yeah. Um, And I will say this too, in a world of COVID, I wasn't allowed to have visitors during this entire time. So I lost my vision. Most people have an advocate, like a family member. Um, I wasn't allowed to have that because there were no visitors allowed in the hospitals at that time. And this was pre-vaccination days. So right when I came home, I think it's also important to note two months after I lost my vision because of my system was so immunocompromised. They had put me on prednisone and I was on azathioprine as well until we could start my infusions. And that's what they had decided to do, rituxan infusions. I got COVID pneumonia and I was isolated for two weeks in the hospital and they thought I'd be fine, but I just tanked very quickly. And I couldn't even walk to the bathroom in the hospital. I had a commode next to my bed for two weeks and I was plugged into the wall on oxygen at home for two months after. And so not only did I have to rehabilitate my body and learn how to walk and cook and ride a bicycle and drive and do all these things as a person who had just lost her vision in one eye, but my lungs are permanently scarred now too. And I had to, and I'd never had pneumonia and it was just, it was 2020 was rough. I'm not going to lie. When people complain about their kids, not going to prom, I'm like, I went blind and had COVID pneumonia. Like, I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not saying I, I compare myself to other people, but sometimes I have to when people complain about things, I just let it go in one ear and out the other, because again, my life got so insane in 2020 and it will never be the same. But I can honestly say that I'm, I'm in a really great place in my life. And I'm, I I have amazing friends and family and, and I'm just living it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I appreciate you saying that because yeah, that's something compounding the fact that, you know, you've already been diagnosed with this life-changing disorder, then also with COVID on top of it, just nightmare scenario, but you're here as proof standing that, that you're strong enough to get through it. So that's awesome. Yeah. So I guess you, we left off where you, you know, you'd gotten home from the hospital. You're obviously experiencing some, some awful side effects from the prednisone and the other medications. Did your physicians refer you to any kind of rehabilitation, anything to help with, you know, visual, the visual issues you are now experiencing or any kind of physical uh, rehabilitation? No. So I did have an occupational therapist in the hospital when I first lost the vision. And my neurologist had asked me if I felt that that was useful, what I had, and I I was very honest with him. He's wonderful. I said, no, it didn't really help that much. I, I really did it on my own. And I think it was the fear of not having, you know, I have a disability that people can't see. I mean, it's not just the vision, but it's also the fatigue that I have. And so, because actually Sjogren's is, is, is recognized by the state of California as a disability because of the fatigue that it causes. And so having those autoimmune diseases like layered on top of one another, I'm sure sometimes I don't know if it's my medication or the fatigue that makes me tired, but I really just rehabbed my body myself. And I've always been very active in terms of hiking. I mean, I will say this, I don't run anymore. I did have a little accident on the trail when I decided to like that some light did end up coming back into my left eye and I have what they call shadow vision in that eye. So I'm completely blind in it, but 
I can see the shapes of some things and it's kind of like grays and blacks and um, a little bit of white. It's like someone took a hammer to a glass table and like a mosaic pattern and smashed it. Like that's what it kind of looks like. It did take my night vision. I can almost not see in the dark at all. I don't really have night vision. I do need some light to get around. But again, you know, I just think that you should go towards things that make you feel afraid. So no, I didn't have a a professional help me, but my best friend and I, we did go camping. And I remember looking at her and saying, Allie, I think oh gosh, the sun's going down. Like I had never been out of my house in the dark at night since I'd lost my vision. And it had been about a year and a half at this time. And she's like, I've got you. Like she had a flashlight for me. All my friends there were amazing. They had this big floodlight like by the campground. And my other friend, she, it was her birthday. She wore this like glitter stick all over her neck. I mean, it was, it was great. And I think it's important to do those things that make you feel frightened. I'm starting horseback riding lessons soon too. And I just, anything that can help with my balance. Yeah. No, that's awesome. Yeah. That that sounds like you're, you've got a handle on it and definitely moving positively in the right direction. Well, and I will say this too. I've always traveled and I lived in Europe for 10 years and to, I worked there, but I will say I took a trip, my first trip alone, because I've traveled all over the world alone. I I moved to Europe alone and I moved to New York alone too when I was younger. And I just wanted to take a trip. And so I took a trip in May of this past year of 2022. And it was the first time I got on a plane by myself again. And yeah, it was great. And then I had a red eye flight on the way home and I realized, oh gosh, they turn off all the lights and I'm not going to be able to see again. But you know, I actually had this really nice man sitting next to me and I had dropped my reading glasses and I can't see anything on the phone without my reading glasses, you know, anymore. And I just told him, I said, I'm blind in my left eye. I just dropped my glasses. I can't see in the dark. He was so nice. I mean, literally he helped me throughout the entire flight. But like I said, most people can't tell. And so, you know, they they don't know until I'm like, I can't see. Can you help me? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's that's great, though. That sounds like an amazing trip. So besides the vision, I think you've talked about a little bit, the vision issues. Do you have any other current symptoms as a result of the NMO? Yeah, I would definitely say I, I have bladder and bowel issues. And I have some weakness in my legs and in my arms. And the fatigue is, is real. The heat sensitivity is probably the worst. And I live in an area where it gets up to 112 and 114 degrees in the summer. So that's been one of the hardest things is to not be able to go outside. I mean, I've tried, I've even sat outside having a summer dinner at five o'clock and it's only 86 degrees in the shade. And I had a scary episode one time and I was with my sister and my best friend and I had to leave and go sit in my car and turn the AC on. So that's, yeah, that's hard. And then just the side effects from, you know, the medication. Yeah. So that leads me into my next question. Are you on any long-term therapies to manage your NMO? And what was the process of deciding which, if any, treatment to choose? What was that process like? And uh, did you feel like you had sufficient information to make an informed decision? Yeah. So I started on 80 milligrams of prednisone and then was put on some azotheoprine as well in the lead up to rituxan infusions, my neuro-ophthalmologist, my neurologist, and my rheumatologist had decided together that that was the best course. And that's what we were going to do. 
initially, and then we tapered me off of the prednisone. I kept on the azathioprine and started the rituxan infusions in January of 2021. I was supposed to start in November of 2020, but I had COVID. And so that got pushed back. Then there were issues with the health insurance company and I was supposed to get my rituxan every six months. Come July, when I was due to have my next rituxan infusion, they decided to substitute it with a biosimilar drug called Ruxians, which I did not react positively to. So I ended up having a rash right away and then it didn't work. And I noticed that I was having vision issues in my right eye. My neuro-ophthalmologist called me after hours when she saw one of my tests that I had just completed and told me to go to the ER. And so I went for an MRI. We started me on a five-day course of uh, solumedrol corticosteroids again. So clearly that drug didn't work and, you know, only to save the health insurance company a few dollars. I've had many issues with them around my infusions. I changed jobs in the process because I needed a job where I could work from home. I was actually an essential worker during COVID. So I was the director of development and communications for our food bank for, for our Sacramento County. And so we never went home during the pandemic. And so, and it was a wonderful place to work and I loved everybody there, but I needed to be somewhere where I could be at home and not in an environment where I was around so many people all the time because my immune system was so compromised. And so I changed jobs. And when I did that, the health insurance that I had was the same health insurance company that I had at my old job. The plan was different, however, and they they delayed my care, which caused me to have some vision loss in my right eye. I was put on Celsept to a very high dose of Celsept to combat the vision loss. And I had to fight it out. I had to go to the Department of Managed Healthcare. Luckily at the time, my boss at my new job, she helped write the legislation around off-label drugs. And she said, that's not legal. They can't do that to you because they treat NMO off-label. Well, I wouldn't even... The drugs they have approved that you know about that were approved in 2019 with the FDA, they wouldn't work on me anyway. I, I'm i seronegative. I don't have the AQP4 antibody anyway. And so I had had Rituxin before. It was approved before. I had to go through the Department of Managed Healthcare with an attorney. I won my case. I got my infusions. But it, it did irreparable damage in my right eye. So I have... um black clouds and cuts in that eye when I used to be able to see more clearly in it. And so, so I'm currently not on mycophenolate anymore, which is Celsept, also known as Celsept. But that drug put me in the hospital a few times because I got a few infections. I got COVID for the third time in June of 2022. And and then I had a stomach bug that I got. And so, you know, I continue to fight the health insurance company for my infusions. I'm supposed to be having them in April. They just approved it, but they only approved it up through March 31st when they well know I get it every six months. And so it's not approved. I'm going to have to go through this process again now. And my doctors, you know, one of them said to me, I've never seen anything like this. Do they, do they want you to go blind and paralyzed? You know, it's not right. What they, what they put people through. Yeah, I completely agree. It's egregious how often we see this, um, you know, just we get SRNA and our community members who have fighting the same types of fights and how it can, your living example of how it can affect someone in real time, these decisions that the insurance company make. So it's, I thank you for sharing because I think it's important to tell these stories and, and bring awareness to this as much as possible. Yeah. I mean, it's hard enough to, 
to have a disease that you might not be able to see or walk and in your life, that's stressful enough. But to compound that with rejecting a drug that you know will help mitigate those issues, it is, it, sh it shouldn't be legal. I have lots of opinions about, about that. Yeah. 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 I, I do as well. <laughs> yeah. So you kind of mentioned that you have been in uh, the hospital for relapses before. I have How many relapses would you say you, you've had? And then what is that experience like? So what is, what do you feel when you, when one is coming on and do you have like a plan of action for when you think you're having a relapse? Mm -hmm. Well, I think sometimes I'm in the hospital for, because my immune system is compromised. Um, and that makes me more susceptible to respiratory infections. And I think those are very dangerous because, you know, most of us know that when you, you can't be around sick people. And so when that happens, I, I go to the ER right away and I get a chest x-ray to make sure I don't have pneumonia, especially because of the scarring in my lung. But for the, I guess when I have like symptoms in my vision, it generally tends to be that sort of mosaic fragmented pattern that I see. I can have pain behind the eyes. What I did forget to mention is a, f a week before I lost my vision, I was in the shower and I had this insane it almost felt like I was drunk. Like I had woken up in the morning, I had gotten in the shower. It was almost like I'd had too much to drink and I, and I hadn't drank. I hadn't had any wine or anything at dinner the night before. And I, and I had to hold myself up in the shower. And I remember driving to work and my brain, it was like, I was on a sea and, and, and then it went away and I didn't think much about it. And I actually had like yeah, I don't know. I dismissed it, you know, like you dismiss things. And sometimes you think you're, you know, middle-aged and you're getting older. And, but what I will say is I'll get dizzy a little sometimes. And then that internal vibration in my body, when it gets really strong, I feel like I'm not doing something right. Meaning I need to slow down. I need to rest. I need to nap. I need to drink electrolytes. You know, I'm really big on hydrating and also on movement. So I try to hike as much as I can. I don't hike for as long. I used to go on eight mile hikes, you know, on the weekends. I don't do that anymore. I mean, I do about three and a half miles now, but uh, I think that's still good, you know, for where I'm at. Yeah, definitely. That's awesome. So are there any tools or tips you have learned since your diagnosis for those living with NMOSD? Well, I guess just being gentle and kind to myself. Setting boundaries with people. Knowing that I can't do it all. Because I do think for me personally, it stems a lot from like symptoms will just stem from me being tired or overexhausted or not feeling like I have to do everything. You know, little things can be hard for me that'll be really easy for everyday people. And it's my personality to want to do things that I used to do, but if I can't lift something or I can't carry something or I'm too tired, I just say it. And I, and I try not to internalize what someone might think about me because of it. I think that's great. And that's a great piece of advice because I, we all are just doing our best. Right. And yeah, you gotta, you gotta be comfortable in that. And I think that's, that's a really important thing to keep in mind. 
when people always say like, but you look so well, or you, you know, and they just don't understand the struggle that it, that it is, you know, and, and I don't want to wear a banner every day either. You know, I don't want my whole life to be about that. I'm not asking anyone to, I don't want anyone to feel sorry for me. I I don't, I'm not a victim, you know, I, but I also, those boundaries need to be respected when I set them. Yeah, definitely. Okay. So Can you just speak a little bit about how you got involved with SRNA and what your experience has been like as a member of our organization? Yeah. So I think like anyone, when I was first, when I first found out what I had, I was very, I didn't want to go on the internet. I actually get asked my neurologist, should I read anything? And he's like, no. He said no. And I was really surprised because, you know, I like to do research, but I will say I have had my dad passed away very quickly in about a four month span and was on hospice after a lung surgery. And I Googled what he was having. (laughs) And that was a really bad idea because when he passed, Google was actually right in the time frame that he was going to die with with what was going on with him and so for my own diseases i just decided not to do that i didn't think it would be helpful i wasn't ready to listen to it i didn't want any advice from anyone um someone actually told me not to call myself blind <laughs> or something which is shocking to me the things that people will say to you i mean I am blind and I'm not ashamed of it. So I don't know why it would make someone else feel uncomfortable. But I just, I, it took me a while. And then to just, I think, accept where I was. I think when I lost the vision right away, everyone was hoping it was going to come back. But in my mind, I had to just, from the very start, I told myself, it's not going to come back and you have to be okay with it not coming back because you have to live your life. And I had a lot I still wanted to do. And so I was like, I was not, and you know, some people, I think we live in a society where people, you know, think I'm a very spiritual person, but think you almost you're manifesting or you willed this onto yourself. No one is, I have not willed this on myself. A neurologist told me in the hospital, he's like, cause I was beating myself up a bit that I had worked too hard, that I had done this to myself in some way. He said, Melanie, if you were laying on a beach in Kauai, that your body was going to do this to you. You know, there's nothing you could have done. And so the way I found SRNA is I was ready. I took me several months, about maybe three or four months I was ready to start learning about what I had. And I found, I did a Google search and I thought, oh, this, this sounds great. This is an association for people with autoimmune diseases. And I've worked with, or neuroimmune diseases. I've worked in several associations here and abroad. And I loved the educational aspect. And I found the ABCs of NMOSD. And I listened to one episode and then I'm like, okay, that's enough. (laughs) I'm not ready to listen to anymore right now. It was hard. It was hard. And then I slowly got through the episodes and it took me almost a year to get through those episodes. And I'm glad I did. And that's how I found SRNA. Yeah. Well, we're glad you found us and I'm glad to be have any help. But yeah, those those ABCs of NMOSD can be a lot of information. So I can understand that that feeling. It's the acceptance, you know, of really facing what you have. And it's everybody's journey is different, right? Definitely. So you recently attended a disability rights gala in Sacramento. Can you describe what the purpose of the event was and just what your experience was like attending? Yeah, so Disability Rights California is the largest, actually, disability rights group 
in the nation. And they advocate for people with all kinds of disabilities. So they were holding this inaugural gala. It was their first one at the Crocker Art Museum. And I was really interested in going. I mean, I'm I'm reaching out more into communities that I feel aligned with. You know, I have a job where I work for an advocacy organization and I've I've, you know, being in the nonprofit space for a long time and kind of being a communications person and a fundraising person to help, you know, marginalized communities in my career, I just was really interested in going as a member of that community. And I met some really great people there and it was all based in art and disability. And so they had a poet and I met some fantastic people there. I took my previous boss that had helped me get my infusions. I took her as my date because she's been such a great patient advocate for me and continues to give me advice on how to fight the insurance companies, which I need on a regular basis and just support that I'm entitled to it and that I will get it and that we just have to persevere. So that was really exciting. And they do a lot of incredible work in many spaces. Yeah. Well, that sounds like a great experience and very important stuff to get involved with. So awesome that you were able to attend and and have a positive experience with it. So can you just talk about a little bit like what the most difficult parts living with NMOC are or just what you what you wish the general public would know about having living with this this disease? I think the hardest part of having NMO is I, you know, I used to really plan for the future and it's so uncertain. And I guess all of our futures are uncertain, but I live in the now a lot more. And I can't say that's a bad thing, but I definitely had to give up any ideas of, you know, I never had, I never had a child and I had been thinking about it and I had talked to my doctor about it before I had been diagnosed and it was definitely a possibility back then. And now that's not, and that's hard. Yeah. But I also think that, you know, I like, again, I'm very spiritual and I think that everyone has a path and a journey in their life to walk. And this is mine. And so through that, I have tried to do things to, I, I participate in research studies because, you know, I don't want anyone else to have to go through what I went through. I don't want anyone to have to go blind to be diagnosed with something they have or, or be paralyzed to, to you know, be diagnosed with something they have. I, I would love for, you know, the the medicine, the technology to catch up, the doctors to put the puzzle pieces together, all of that. And so I feel like I've turned all of that sort of sadness or frustration into something positive. I'm actually writing a book and about my health journey. And I'm starting a foundation too, to help scientific research, but also help maybe change, get some of those healthcare codes in there that aren't for people. And so I've just been doing a lot of exploratory work and finding out, you know, where my niche is. And I, you know, I work in the state capital of California and I think there's an opportunity there. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's amazing stuff for sure. I guess my last question and kind of touched on it a bit with that last question, but what are you hopeful for? 
optic nerve regeneration. <laughs> I think that's like the hot topic for me. Every time I go into my neuro ophthalmologist's office, you know, I want to hear about grants that the NIH is funding. And I always have questions around that. And she's very positive about that. And so, you know, I think that I might not be able to ever bring back what I've lost, but it could, research could help combat anything that may happen to me in the future or anyone else living with this disease. I think that that's a great thing to be hopeful for. It's awesome. Well, Melanie, I think that brings us to the close of the podcast, but I just wanted to once again, say how grateful we are for you joining us today and, you know, being vulnerable and sharing your story. I think the more people who who share their stories, the more people will will feel less alone and and also bring to light some of the important issues that that we talked about today. So just thank you. Well, thank you for inviting me and everything that SRNA does. I know it has touched my life very much and when you asked me to be part of this podcast, I wanted to be vulnerable because I don't want people to feel alone and um yeah, just keep going and live your life and do the things that make you afraid, you know? Yeah, that's awesome. Well, thank you so much.